Good afternoon. We're here for the Somerset Library History Series, and my name is Rita Lawson. I want to welcome all of you. Good to see all these familiar faces. And today we have the privilege of hearing from Charles and Mary Ann Treasure about their century farm and their family histories that go back an amazing amount of time. I know for some reason, um there's a lot of Germans in the north part of the township, and I guess I'll first off I'll list a few of them as Treasure, Pappenfuss, Wickelman, Krogman, Kiesel, Haas, Bierbrauer, Klotzky, Shanewell, Mordick, Arndt, Biedermann, Schiffelbein, Martin, <laughs> lots more, lot more he had, but that's, that's one batch of them. My father, our grandfather, Louis Treasure, was born in Darmstadt, Germany in 1859 came to this country, I suppose, in 1853, because I was there, I've got his citizenship papers. They were 1854. He homesteaded 80 acres in the town of Star Prairie. In 1855, we had the original patents for those two. We sold that land, don't have it anymore. But <clears throat> Then in 1860, he homesteaded 80 acres to where we live now. Of course, uh, later on he did some more because it's 120 there now. But <clears throat> and uh, he must have lived there before he homesteaded it because he already had the log house, I guess. I suppose he did when he got married. He married Gertrude Cook in 1859. They walked to Hudson and get married because he was Lutheran and she was Catholic. Couldn't find anybody around here to marry her, so they had to go to Hudson. And the story is that they brought flour, sugar, salt back home to start housekeeping. Well, it must have worked because in the next 21 years they had 11 children. <coughs> all married and all the kids married and lived to be over 60 years old, which was quite remarkable at that time too. And um, Gertrude Cook it was K-O-C-H in Germany and a C-O-O-K in this country. She had three sisters and a brother that married parents, all from the same family. Um, Kate married a parent, that's Deacon Morse's grandmother. Anna married Joe Parent, Lester Martell's grandmother. Um, what was the other one? Oh, well, Mary Mary Jed Parent. They lived in Somerset sometime. I guess they moved to Silent, but that's Anna Blue's grandmother. <laughs> and then there was John Parent that married Denise Parent, or John Cook that married Denise Parent. That's um, Carmen Milky's grandfather. And then she had two other brothers lived in north of up there too. Mike Cook, uh, they didn't live there very long, but they're in the old time plat books. But they moved to Farmington. But then there was Theodore Cook. They had 16 kids. Uh, Elmer started the racetrack. Eli had a salvage yard north of Somerset here, right next south of Bernard Bovey's. I think my dad bought gas there for six gallons for a dollar or less and I don't know he had a shed out the back with all his antique parts or model tea parts in there I don't know I think from Swanberg he must have found all kinds of money built back in there and I think that's right where he built <clears throat> and then there, uh, <clears throat> Urban married Pat Demling of course they farmed by Johannesburg Leland and um, was the other Roy, they each ran bars, one in Stanton, one in Hurdle. And then Henry, he used this, you have to get these names here, he married Aurora Lamrant. Their daughter Fabiola married Lloyd Bro. He was uh, Mayor Hudson not too long ago, and his daughter is now, yeah. his son is now, yeah. Jackie Bro is. And then Myrna. Henry's Myrna married Earl Parent. He was the slot machine king, I guess, in Somerset. George Cook told me one time he see uh, Earl Parent bought a 
bought a farm north on, on 65, just north of the uh, motorcycle track there. Shallow lived there late, late, I think Perry Olson lives there now. But George Cook was a carpenter and he was working there for Earl. And uh, he says, uh, you want to see, Earl said, you want to see some nickels? He took him in a room and had 15 bushel of nickels sitting on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think he started um, Earl's Bar yeah. at Loch Ness yeah. Now. They, uh, there was eight, eight children born in the log house at home there. And then they built a new house, the one where we live in now. It was built in 1875. And then there was three more treasures built born there. I don't know what they did for a living, but they, uh, our, one part of our house has got a deep basement, and in the corner of it there was a boarded off there and there was a spring and they always said that's where grandma treasure cooled her butter made butter and cooled it there and then took it to <clears throat> to marine in the winter time they took it to marine and took it down the river on the ice with horses or whatever or walked down or whatever and then in the summer i suppose they took it down and met the boats there at marine to I don't know why Stillwater, but I guess there was, that was a... There was a ferry down there. Oh, yeah, to go across, but they uh, that. they went down the river. Yeah, the ferry was there, but... Yeah, to get there. My dad talked about hauling wood, firewood, Stillwater, down the river on this lake. And... Um, and I don't know, I suppose they just kept... Had to work, clear the land and growing crops. I don't know what they grew for sure, but we found an old ledger that my grandfather had. Couldn't read it, most of it's in German, but <laughs> but anyway, in, in 18, 1890, uh, 1887 shows his taxes were $34.06, and he bought a bushel of apples for a dollar and a quarter. I don't know, he... Uh, wrote stuff in English more, but when my grandmother started taking it over, then it was all in German, so he couldn't get any of it. Anyway, in January, he sold 100 bushels of oats for 15 cents, and 38 bushels arrived for $10.50. The oats was 50 cents, 15 cents a bushel. And he sold a cow for $30, which was pretty good, I guess. And then in 1886, he paid James, James Dorr for a thrashing, and they had um, wheat 340 bushel and oats 891 bushel and rye 83 and a half bushel, which... Tell them where James Dorr lived. Well, James Dorr lived uh, west of us. Uh, they owned quite a bit of land there. Yeah. You know, Langers. and then uh, I think he had uh, Wickelman's down in, well, Grandview Estates right now, down, no, down in the hole there. There was yeah. a house. Okay. Harold Schachter lived Harold there for a while yeah. after, yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, in 88, he had uh, thrashed 81 bushel of wheat and 91 bushels of rye, but he had 936 bushel of oats, and he paid him $20 for the thrashing. My grandfather was buried, in, or died, in, well, he was buried in June 12, 1899, same day, just an urchin tornado. They all, my dad said that they were in the yard after the funeral, come back home there, and and um, people came by and said there had been a tornado in Richmond, and of course then the family all left, and some found their houses blown away when they got home. One of the pallbearers, who they don't know his name, but he died, and he left to go home right away, and he died in the tornado. <clears throat> I think his name was Barrett, but we don't know because Mike Cook was married to Barrett, and I just assumed that that was the one that died. I have no idea who. My dad was the youngest. He was born in 1881. In, in 1904, he decided he wanted to go to North Dakota. He homesteaded in North Dakota. We've got some letters that he wrote to my mother back. I don't know whether we got 10 of them there, a stack of letters. But I guess he didn't like that out there, or else, or else she attracted him back home. I don't know what it was, but 
the letters postmarked, he always said he was, I always asked him, and he said he was uh, west of Dickinson, or west of Mandan. Well, the letters are postmarked in New England, and when we looked on where on the map, that's almost to the Badlands out there. So I can see why he came back, anyway. And uh, they were married in nine, January 15, 1907. Married Teresa Mary Janky. She, um, <coughs> she was born in Stillwater. My mother, my grandmother was born in Stillwater in 1888. 304 North Stillwater Avenue. Hmm. <laughs> at a house that her dad had built in 1881. She moved to Farmington and when she was 12 years old, and her brother moved into the house. And then after that, there were some of her nieces and nephews there. So there was Jankies in that house in Stillwater for 101 years. Okay. And we were stopped in there one day, trying to get a picture of it, and they haven't, nothing's changed. The house is just the same as it was then, same ever. Yeah. Same sighting. Got the same sighting on it. There's a uh, guy that writes, Jim Henson, he's a Stillwater historian. He's written books about North Hill, South Hill, and Dutchtown. I got the one on the North Hill, and that's it. That house is pictured in that book. Because my mother always called that Dutchtown, but I guess they they moved Dutchtown out farther, and they ended up being uh, North Stillwater, or North Hill. My dad had ten brothers and sisters. My mother had ten brothers and sisters, so that I ended up with 90, 89 first cousins. Wow. Ninety-three of them. With my had four in our family, so there was ninety-three first cousins. Grandma Treasure lived with them, with my folks most of their time, most of the time, I guess. Sometimes she was in Richmond with my, one of her other other sons, but. Uh, she lived with us most of the time. <clears throat> we sold milk to the cheese factory, owned by by Grants, which was Lagrangers. It was on the northwest part of the township, way over on the county line. And uh, yeah, right. Here's one of them. My mother said that Grandma Treasures cried because she said they would lose, get cheated by going to the shipping full milk to the cheese factory because they always made the butter and sold that and and they did get cheated because there was no back, no test at that time for butter fat. They just had to pay you so much a hundred and they were supposed to pay by the amount of cheese you got. Well, if you had a high test or some people, uh, actually watered the milk down because all they got so much a hundred didn't make any difference so i don't know how long that took on anyway in the early teens they started victory cheese factory it was just east of us where well Cleve knutson lived there last that was organized by farmers i think about 1915 i think it was i got a got this share that my dad had bought in that I had a brother, Bernard, sisters Henrietta and Lil. Lil was 11 years older than me, so I was kind of an orphan there. Actually, he was spoiled. Yeah, that's what they always said, anyway, that I was a nasty yeah, one. a nice story about him. Yeah. When they wanted to get him going, they'd tell him he was born. They would tell him he was born on Main Street in Osceola. Oh. And, then, and that's the house is still there, but they didn't mean in the house. They meant on <laughs> Main Street. <laughs> no, I got it here. See, Henrietta married Morse Johnson, 1832. Lil stayed with them in the Richmond while she went to high school. She graduated from high school in 1934. Then she worked at Kelly's Cafe for five dollars a week in Richmond for a while. One summer, both Henrietta and Lil worked at Friday's for sixteen cents an hour. In 1935, my brother went to the city to work. I don't know where he went for sure, but he ended up being a painter over there, painted houses and interior stuff. 
1910 New Barn was built, and it's the one that's there now. Logs were sawed, cut in the woods, dad cut in the woods in the winter, took them to Farmington to have them sawed. And they, was, they always said there was no rain or snow the whole month of March that they built that barn. That's somebody that had one load of hay to put in it because it never did rain, I guess. 1910 goes down as one of the driest years on record. From then until later on, I don't know much went on. I guess they just fine farmed. 1926, they moved to Osceola and rented the farm because, I don't know, if he was, wasn't was feeling good or they wanted to get out of farming for a while or why the reason, I never could find out the reason they moved to Osceola. And Grandma Treasure still lived with them. She died two weeks before I was born on March 9th, 1927. So, do the maths if you want to know. <laughs> 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 and then what the last house they lived in Osceola had two chicken coops. And they raised chickens. They were in with the Heyman hatchery and dresser, and they, they were testing farina feeds. They sold eggs, they shipped them to Chicago. We have a ledger that Dad kept, and one load, one time they shipped 83 dozen, got 23 cents for them. And this was for the de before the Depression, so I suppose things were going pretty good then. 1931, the renter couldn't pay the money, pay the rent anymore, and wanted to leave, and so my folks had them move back to the back to the farm. <clears throat> it wasn't a very good time to start farming again, the height of the depression. He had to borrow money to get started. It took him, well, it was after the war before he finally got that few bucks paid off, I guess, that he borrowed. I mean, he always said he bought a, but he bought a team and a wooden wagon and a Case manure spreader on an auction for four hundred dollars. At that time, the auction was only Squaw Lake. I don't know who it was. I thought it was Joe Reboyne, but I'm not sure who the auction had. But he bought that for four hundred dollars. <throat> As I said, it wasn't a good time to start. Hogs were two cents a pound. Milk was milk cows were 20 to 25 dollars, milk was 8 cents a gallon on the farm, eggs were 10 cents, probably even less than that. I, I can't quite remember for sure what it was, but there wasn't much uh, going on. 1934 and 36 was dry, they had no feed, government gave them feed loans. Many people lost their farms to the Federal Land Bank during that time. They, uh, some people, it's just like uh, old uh, Lowell was saying that here, when he talked here, he said the wives bought the farm back for half price. Some of them rented their farms back so they could get them, or keep them until they get back on their feet so they could buy them again. They borrowed money in the 20s and built houses yeah, up in our areas, all kinds of big old square houses that they lost their farms over. Dad had to work that loan off. He worked on the Marine Hill. I remember he went down there with horse and dump box on the wagon to haul gravel on the Marine Hill. One other time he drove down to Scout Road and used a shovel down there, I guess. In his ledger that he wrote in 1936 with a team of horses for six days, he had $33.60. Wages weren't too high then either. At that time he was hauling milk to the Victory Cheese Factory. Later on he separated and hauled the cream down to Somerset here. And the telephone company is using that lot for storage back there where the factory was. And then later on we sold whole milk to Maple Island. And during the war they you had to ship wherever they, people told you. That time we had to sell the Pine Lake Cheese Factory because that's the truck that went by there. And, and sometimes that 
there's a lot of bad winter and they had no to tear trucks around decent. Sometimes we'd all leave milk out, dragging milk out to the road at 12 o'clock at night. That's when the truck came. Adolf Kiesel was driving truck that time and there was quite a mess. But you had to, you couldn't do anything different. Of course, as soon as that was over with, well, then we, I think we went back to Maple Island. 1949, we built a milk house and got on grade, grade A and sold to Clear Lake. 1953, we're in Twin City Milk, selling cans. And then 1956, they came through and put in bulk tanks. Eddie Germain, more Spargeon, and we were the first ones at that time to get bulk tanks. They just came, went right down the line, put tanks in all their customers. I started school in 1934 in Archie Paquin's basement. The house had burnt, or the house, the schoolhouse had burnt in the spring of 34, and they finished school in his porch on there, but then the next fall when I started, we started in the basement. There was 36 pupils in the basement, and a lot of them in a little bitty basement. <laughs> then moved back in the new school at, at Christmas time. First grade teacher was Bernice Pilgrim. Second, third, fourth teacher was Agnes, Agnes uh, Purnell. Well, she ended up being cook. My mother boarded her. <laughs> Archie Bacon, I think, boarded Bernice Pilgrim, but my mother had boarded teachers before that uh, quite a bit, I guess, because we were right close to the school. Fifth grade teacher was Annie Kickover. She was Annie Olson then. Sixth and seventh grade teacher was Bernice or Florence Keeley. She was. <laughs> I don't think my mother slept. She stayed at our house too. She lived. She had her upstairs. Got a wood stove up there. And an, and an Aladdin lamp. I don't know if you know that Aladdin lamp, sorry. You know. Turn them way up and then the mantle would get all black. She'd fire up that stove and then sit in the chair and fall asleep. Oh, 12 o'clock at night, she'd start roaming around out there, up there. But she was, she was a city person that didn't belong out in the country at all. But, uh, <laughs> she was a good enough teacher, but... Uh, and the eighth grade teacher was Tilly Krenz. She was Krenz then, now she's bait. She's up at the health center. Yeah. They, they don't have too much others about the school. They, we went sliding out on a hill. My father, my brother-in-law, Morris Johnson, was a worked at the ski factory in Richmond, so he kept me supplying, supplying toboggans and skis. <laughs> but we had a, there was a hill right across from our driveway. It's gone now. The road used it for fill when they built H. We used to run over there, and we had a. Well, we thought it was a pretty high jump, I suppose it was six inches, but you get three, four <laughs> kids going off of that jump with a with a toboggan, they broke a few of them on there. And, and uh, the other big thing was the Christmas programs. We uh, usually put on a pretty good play, or at least we thought it was. I don't know, it would probably go for the program, the whole program would probably go for at least an hour sang the religious songs that they can't sing in the school now. I mean, you know, sang well, all the old Christmas songs. Everybody had a recitation to say. And it, it was lots of fun. The first radio we got was a battery one in 1936, or about that time. I don't know when for sure, but you only listen to a shows that you wanted. I listened to when I came home from school. Well, I had the whole wood in the house first. And I, after that, I listened to Tom Mix and Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy, <laughs> or Wheaties. And uh, that night, I don't know, well, Jack Penny was always popular, but I was telling Marianne the other day, but they had gangbusters. And when that siren went, my mother wasn't, they were shutting that radio off right now. <laughs> Electricity came through in 1942. We had just the bare minimum in the house because you couldn't get wired during the wartime. Just one one light and that's about all you could get. 
at five dollars for 40 kilowatts. Many farmers didn't even take it because they weren't going to use no 40 kilowatts of power. So some of them they didn't took years before they hooked on. I don't know. It's quite a change from now. I, I got down here. I don't know what the didn't ask. The last bill is. $980. <laughs> now Chip says the last one they got a $65 surcharge because the railroad charging so much to haul coal to them so they had to put a $65 hauling coal surcharge on it. Couldn't buy any appliances during the war. We got a, well the ice man came yet, of course we had ice box and ice, that was the only Otherwise, we we had a well pit about eight feet deep, and we put our watermelons down in there to cool. We got a re first refrigerator, I think, in about 1946. I'm not sure, but it was somewhere along that time. Milky machine was, well, I think it was 1945. That was a pretty crude outfit, too. The, the milk, milk went right in the cans. There was a pump on each side to pump. Uh, everything was right there. Electricity was so weak at that time, that night, to drawing a lot of power, you had to almost help it go over <laughs> because it was just there was hardly any power. The lights was all dim because everybody had hooked on and they couldn't get build their power plants fast enough. <clears throat> Bought our first tractor in 1945. Had it. There again, you had to sign up with the ration board and wait to your turn. We got a WD WC Alice plow and cultivator for thirteen hundred and ten dollars. Bought it from Bernard Olson in Richmond. He is where the bank in Richmond is right now. And um, <clears throat> in the late thirties. They used to stack the grain. Well, in the early 40s, they started shock thrashing, where you hauled the shocks right into the grain bundles right into the thrash machine. There would be eight or ten farmers go together, make a thrashing run, exchange help, so you could everybody had help. And uh, we went to the East Don H. I guess there was eight of them there. Some of the names around there, the threshing machine owners, were Jack Biederman, Adel Birbar, George Arndt, mm -hmm. Ernest Wickelman. We had one silo that we filled with silage, shocked the rest of the corn, and shredded it in October and November. Blew the shredded corn into the barn and got the cobs for the pigs and cows. Nineteen forty-six. I went with Charlie Beers on a shredding run. Went for eleven days. Started out at home, and we went up on the flat, <coughs> Johnson's, and we're way down the other side of Cedar Lake. There used to be a guy come around selling Anton or auto pop and foos from Cumberland. Came around, and sold rutabagas every fall. Well, he went there because we had rutabagas every day, <laughs> and I. <laughs> And I don't like a man. <laughs> Everybody thought that was a big treat because they had rutabagas. <laughs> we had to pitch the hay on the wagon by hand, like everybody else did, I guess. We got a halo about 1945, but that was a big help. Otherwise, you haul it to the barn and pull it up with a rope, just like the horse was talking about. You had to drive the horses on the on the rope to pull the day up into the mall. <clears throat> Later on, Selmer Holden bought a case boyer tie baler. Well, we exchanged with him. We helped him, and then we we used that for a while. It was kind of a dirty job. Two people had to sit on the back, one on each side, feed the wires through, and then tie them. Dump them on the ground, and you still had to go pick them up. You just well, I used the halo, I guess. But <laughs> now, where they throw it into the wagon, it isn't quite so bad. Bought a chopper, forage chopper, in 1940, 52. 
Then we chop dry hay then and silage. 1952, we bought our first combine. It was now Shelmer's. And of course, that was the end of thrashing then forever. Now we chop the oats for silage. We don't even have a combine. And there's one other thing, the drought years, you know, there was no cover, just washed dishes, ditches all over, big fields were big ditches. Well, then the government decided you better plant some trees. Well, everybody planted trees, and of course now they're still planting trees, and that's anybody that's been gone for a while and comes back around here, they just can't believe all the trees there are because it's uh, it's everything covered. All them big old ditches are all covered with trees. And <clears throat> just about to the end here. Anyway, Lester was talking that they stopped at Pruno's. Well, that's got a history to that place too because... <laughs> I didn't know the history, otherwise I wouldn't have stopped. <laughs> <laughs> that was that started out by a name a guy by the name of Jack Satella. He was married to Olga Wickelman. Wickelmans lived down in the hole there. It's now uh, uh, Grandview Estates, and they uh, he started out a mile east or a mile and a half east. He actually he was in Polk County. Started in a house at a. I suppose all they had was beer then, because it was that was it was in prohibition. And um, I don't know. After prohibition, he decided he wanted to come to St. Croix County, so he built a little built a place on the corner there, where it's now Potting's Bar. Highway 35 used to go right in front of it, you know, right around them curves. I mean, all them curves are right around there. Well, and he sold that to Art Pruno. And then his, he sold it, or however, his sister, Agnes Bradford, had it. A guy by the name of Adolf Bierbrower was in there with her. He ran a repair shop. And then there was Sellers owned it. And he sold it to Mel Amos. And then it burned. And then Amos built a small Quonset there. Well, of course, then it was Mel's hut for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. Well, then Andy Lemire bought it. He had that bar in town here. We used to be Jake's Barbershop. I know it was right here. Is that in the parking lot, or is that where Ben's? Uh, no, it, that's where Ben's was, isn't it? Uh, no, it no. was between Ben's and that big house that they moved out. Yeah. Yeah. Probably his parking lot right now. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, he moved that up there. Andy Lemire moved that up there and attached it to that, that hut. And uh, I don't know, we had it for quite a few years, and then he, I don't know if he died or that's the reason he sold it anyway. Ken Potting bought it and built that the whole south or west end there is where he has his uh, parties and so on in there. Well, I guess he's got it for sale now, but can't find any buyer. Or... So that's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell Lester, Lester said he stopped at the bar <laughs> on, his, on his way home from somebody. Well, we stopped at the bar on the way home from church to get a half a gallon of ice cream and then went home as fast as we could so it didn't melt before we ate our dinner. <laughs> that was my trip to the bar. <laughs> I had to follow the gang. Oh, you, oh, you followed the gang. <laughs> I was the driver. They demanded a stop, so I could <laughs> her, dad, her dad stopped there one time, and of course he didn't talk English or he had broken English, and he came home and he said he saw a whale at the bank, at the, the, at the bar. Couldn't figure out who whale was. Well, it was Vale. <laughs> in the German, it came out well. <laughs> now, my story is a little different. My dad came from Germany as an orphan. and Well, he was orphaned at an early age, and he came here in 1910. He lived in New York and Florida. 
and then farmed in southern Minnesota. My mother's family, which I did not know till about five years ago, well, we knew they were English, but we had no family history. William Chapman came from England, was the first recorded birth date was John Chapman in Gloucester, Connecticut in 1653. One Joseph Chapman was born in 1757 in Norwich, Connecticut, served as a lieutenant in the Continental Army and fought at the Battle of Lexington. Our grandchildren are the 11th generation. Well, then my folks moved to Somerset or to Wisconsin in 1929. We moved to Somerset in 1933 to what was then called the Stephan Farm. This was a, a big layout, which they lost in the Depression. <laughs> there was a large barn, a granary, machine shed, and a two-story chicken coop. And only the house remained after the 1952 tornado. <laughs> they were, you weren't living there? Was no, we had just Fred moved Shock off. Fred Shock was really moving. Oh, yeah. Fred Shock yes, just moved there. We, we just moved off yeah. in the spring. Yeah. Uh-huh. Now this farm, the, the barn was at the bottom of the hill and everything gravitated towards the barn. There was a big cistern on this barn. I don't know how big it was. I can't remember. It was big. And all the water was pumped by the windmill into the cistern. And therefore the water gravitated down to the barn so the cows had running water. But guess who hauled water? <laughs> the house. <laughs> it was hand pumped and everything had to be carried into the house. Now we only burnt wood for fuel, so my brothers and dad would have to cut out in the woods, haul it all home and have a big sawing party. Well, guess what our job was? <laughs> hauling all this wood into the shed and then every night after school hauling it into the house for one day at a time. <laughs> that was that was our job. We had the usual animals on the farm, and in the fall, we butchered pigs, and I would imagine the beef, because we made sausage, our own homemade sausage. I can remember coming home from school and seeing these big, long poles stretched, stretched across chairs with ring after ring after ring of sausage on there. <laughs> Uh, and when we raised chickens, we ate a lot of chickens, and I can always remember my mom saying, company is coming, you better kill some chickens. <laughs> <laughs> so guess who had to pick feathers? <laughs> I couldn't clean a chicken, but I sure could pick feathers. <laughs> this farm had a lot of hills and woods, and that's where we spent our time sliding, sledding. I liked to, we liked to go out on moonlight nights. That was the best time for for sledding for us. And we played in the barn. We made swing ropes and slid from one end of the barn to the other, landing in the fresh hay wherever we could <laughs> find it. And then later made tunnels in the baled hay. Summers we spent swimming in Pine Lake or got a ride down to Marine on the St. Croix. To this day, I don't know how I'm here because I cannot swim. <laughs> 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 and in, sometimes on the 4th of July, we rode the ferry to Marine for a celebration. And some of the things they did there, they had contests, climbing grease poles. Well, this was just for boys, of course, and catching a grease pig. <laughs> <laughs> Our Christmases, we always spent at church for a Christmas children's program, after which we received a bag of nuts, an apple, and an orange and candy. And that was a real treat during the Depression. We never had a Christmas tree until Christmas morning. It was not brought in the house, and I think that's a German custom. Right. We had the regular, no light bulbs, regular candles, so I think it was only lit maybe two times. And then it was in a cold room. It had to be in the cold room. So we, we very seldom saw it. <laughs> and for Christmas, now this I think is either German or English. We had goose. Germans have goose. Goose. We always had goose. Yeah. Um, 
and goose is real rich and, <laughs> and you had and there was a lot of grease on there so my mother would have to get all that grease off of that goose and then when it after it hardened then she'd use that for lard and it made the most delicious pie crust you could ever taste. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't that sound awful? <laughs> oh yes, for a lot of other things. One time I had an earache and I made a mistake and told her. <laughs> she warmed up some goose grease and put it in my ear <laughs> and that was the end of it. <laughs> okay, now I want to start talk about going to school. Some people said they didn't even know there was a great school in Somerset, and I can't find anybody who really could tell me much information. I have one picture from Andy Vanoss. It was east of the Vanoss store, but I don't know. Well, anyway, I started school here in 1939 when the Pine Lake School burnt down. Boy, I thought, I'm going to a big city school now. <laughs> one room <laughs> with not very many children. These are some of the grades. Now I talked to a girl this, more, this noon that I went to first and second grade school with. The people in school that she could remember were the Grafs, the Skifsteads, the Nadus, Bobby Helzer, Johnny Lesky, and Stracy's. And those are the only names we could come up with. This was back in 1939. Now, Roberta, you're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the public school, right? This was the public school. So One, all the other uh, children of that age would have been at St. Anne's. At everyone would have been at, at the Catholic school. Mm -hmm. But then, see, there was Sand Hill School, too. Well, Sanders. now, yeah. 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 see, and we started Catholic here schools. because yeah. Yeah. Uh, because our school burnt down. Yeah. Most of the students went to Osceola, but my dad wouldn't allow us to go to Osceola because they had to go to school in a panel truck. <laughs> he took us to school because he was hauling cream to the cheese factory here in Somerset. Well, I don't know if he quit and got on the milk route too, like everyone. Then we had to walk to the highway, two miles and stand and wait for the bus and walk home every night. So when these kids in town say, gee, that's a long ways to walk, <laughs> I didn't think it was too far. <laughs> um, I was going to wait a minute now. Well, we started in the, the school was built in 1937. Uh, never more than one or two pupils to a grade. Uh, teach, my teachers were Miss Scott, Mrs. Jack Raleigh, Mrs. Art Landry, and Mrs. Berlin. Three, three graduated from grade school in 1943, two in 1944, and when I graduated from grade school, there was three of us in our class. In, in 1947, there was 15 in the whole school. As, at, uh, let me see now. As country school closed, by 1950, there were 32 students, and I got these out of the annual pictures. Mm -hmm. I have a good one of Roberta. <laughs> okay. Well, we had many school programs. One thing I always remember was the Armistice Day program. We always had that at 11 o'clock, and then school got out at 12, and we all went home. Now they don't hardly mention it, I don't think. It's Veterans Day. We always had a large Valentine party at school when everyone brought treats school picnics, sometimes at school, and sometimes we went down by the river. I remember going down there one time, and Merli Mrs. Berlin made caramel apples over an open fire. I thought that was just extraordinary for a teacher. <laughs> and that's about all I have to say about going to school in Somerset. I remember the gym was nice and new, and the little kids, we weren't allowed in it. It was for the big boys. <laughs> That, that was about it. We had running water in the house. We had a tank upstairs in the attic. When she mentioned that there, I forgot about talking about it before. We had the pump we had would, on the upstroke, would pump water up high enough so we could get it into the tank upstairs in the attic. So we had running water to the kitchen, but that's, that's all. You still had to carry them. You had to carry the slop out. 
But we had a, what they call a waterfront in the stove, so the water went through that, you had a tank in the back, so you had hot water to it, and then, but no no pressure, it was just from that tank upstairs, and of course that, that worked real good until it ran over and came down through the ceiling, but it didn't shut the windmill off quick enough. Or a mouse would get in it, that would be real nice, but. And then they talked about butchering. Well, butchering pigs was a quite a, a quite a procedure. You had, we had a big iron kettle with a housing around it. You built a fire under that, got the water boiling in there, and, and then take it from there and dump it in a put it in a barrel. And then you had a with a block and tackle, pull that pig up and down in that water to get the to scald it and scrape that off and. Now I get later years. I guess they skinned them. I don't know. We never did. But they, and, and, well, and you had to make sausage. And of course, it, sometimes my mother would take the clean the intestines for the for the sausage casing. And you can still see it there, squeezing the stuff out of the casing <laughs> and wash that. Then you had to take and turn them inside out so you could scrape the fat off the outside, and then that was the casing. You just packed them in salt, and that was the casing. Well, later on, they got tired of that, and of course, then you went to the store and bought them. But then she didn't always like them because sometimes they were too weak. They'd break when you stuffed them. But then you mix the sausage in, a, in the wash, wash tub to be uh, uh, hamburger, well it wasn't hamburger, but the ground pork and fat and everything else that went in there and mixed it up in a wash tub and then you put uh, our saucy stuff where you put it in here and you put a handle down, the plunger went through and and filled uh, the casing. And then you take them out and smoke them and like you say, hang them on a room handle between two chairs. And something else I was going to say about that butcher. Oh, well, of course, when Molly Loris that day, she talked about catching the blood. Well, you had to do that, and you had to run to the snowbank with it right away to <laughs> keep stirring it so it wouldn't curdle. And then made blood sausage. I don't know what they made that out of, but it was, I think, some of the heart and liver went into that blood sausage. My brother-in-law was Norwegian, so he caught it, and he made some kroop, I think they called it. Kroop. It was... Uh, Flour and, as far as I know, flour rolled it in blood. Um, flour rolled the blood in water. They, they, they stirred it a lot. I mean, they just stirred, yeah, stirred sure. the thing that you wouldn't believe. I think uh, something like that, anyway, what they called it. And, uh, of course, then, my, then you had to fry the, take the lard out of the, fry the lard out of the, had to heat that, put that in a big old kettle, and get that lard all boiling, and then strain the, cracklings out of that and then they put that in the syrup pills and you had the lard for the next year. My mother just hated that as she ran out and had to go and buy in the store by that, <laughs> that soft old pink lard in the store. Well then she took them cracklings, mixed it with I don't know what, uh, liver and heart and everything else I guess went into that and mixed that up and set that outside, uh, cooked it and set that outside to freeze. And in the morning she'd go out and slice some of that off and then fry it. We ate that with, with uh, corn syrup. Oh. Man, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> that stayed with you, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, and for breakfast a lot of times, well then I had um, Fire cooking. Well, it was turned into, to, uh, what? Pancakes? Pancakes, sir. No, 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 uh, omelet is all it was. But when I was in school one day, and, or one time, and they were telling, asking what you ate for breakfast. Well, how was I going to spell air cooking? <laughs> in fourth grade, how was I spell air cooking? So I just, I just put eggs. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, they made all kinds of others. Made pickled pig's feet out of that, head cheese, cut all the meat off the head, and yeah. a bunch of gelatin and stuff, and made the head cheese. And uh, well, that's all there is. Does anyone have questions?
Have you two ever thought about getting married? <laughs> <laughs> what? Have you ever thought about getting married? Oh, yeah. We, uh, we, we, have been. we, didn't, hear, we didn't hear the story of how oh, you I met. Oh, I didn't hear the story. And how did you, you met? How did the two of you meet? Oh. Well, here you are. <laughs> she worked in LaGrange's store. Well, I always had to come in and buy something. And uh, finally, I t talked her into going out. And that went on from there. <laughs> there must be more to it. <laughs> no, not too much, I don't think. No. <laughs> yeah. I used to come in the store, and I thought, oh my, look at him. He's got his bill on his hat. Turn yeah. right up. Turn the hat up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And we were married in 1954. So we've had a good life together. Yeah. And it works. <laughs> He's Catholic, and I'm Lutheran. So yeah. if you want it to work, it can work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to say we always had a, you always had a fast on Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, you know. Oh boy, the Catholic you couldn't eat nothing. I, first time she went to church on Wednesday night, she took sandwiches for lunch. Oh, and I, that cured the whole thing right there. Right? It was all fake. It's kind of it's kind of amazing, really, because uh, I'm from Southwest Minnesota, and our farm was six miles from her farm. Oh my goodness! Oh. We didn't know each other until he came to fix our well one time, and he she was it was her uh, folks' my, farm. She yeah. had, uh, she was born. Yeah, I live north of yeah I lived north of Somerset all my life. <laughs> <laughs> I know that that you have many pictures put out on the table over there, and uh, there's some on the corner. Everybody and there's a nice book. book that somebody's been working on over there of, of the family history, some and the some other too, some other pictures and some original documents of uh, from the family. And so it'd be great if people took a look at them, and mm -hmm. if you have any questions there, they'd be happy to answer. More questions? Question. Did you have any children? <laughs> yeah, one sitting back there. <laughs> the other one is the other one is bank refrigeration or bank mechanical. Trace married to Dave Bank. Yeah. Well, what does the farm do now? What are you are you still growing produce uh, or? Ask, ask Chip what he's doing. Oh, they're, they're milking eighty cows there now. They're milking eighty cows on the farm there now. And that's all. We. Uh, Folks always had chickens. That was another thing I should have talked about during the Depression. The chickens was probably what brought them out of the whole thing because we uh, put a chicken coop upstairs in the barn, as did many other farmers. East on H and South, uh, McElfrey's had one, Nelson's, Strobin's all had them upstairs in the barn. And um, we had, well, we had two other chicken coops. I think that one year they had somewhere around three to four hundred laying hens and uh, but I hated chickens <laughs> and as uh, soon as I don't know this was all this all happened in the 30s what you tell about? he hated so chicken bad that the last time when we had chickens they tore the chicken coop down and it was never clean <laughs> that was his love of chickens <laughs> hey, can I mention something? Yeah. when we were first married we were living on a farm just west of Somerset here on my uncle's farm and we had some uh, relation from the city come out, and they wanted some fresh eggs. And we didn't have enough to fill their order. I said, come on down to the chicken coop with me. And so we got down to the chicken coop, and this one kid grabbed this egg. And the chicken had just jumped off the nest. <laughs> well, that's no worm! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Question in the back. How many years have you had the Christmas display? Oh. oh, how many years have you had the Christmas display? I don't know, I guess that goes back uh, 20 years, I suppose. So you started it? Yeah. Well, we started pretty small with a few lights, and then it kept getting bigger and bigger. I don't know when it's going to stop. <laughs> Each. I guess that's the only reason we keep going is when people say how nice it was and thank us for it and everything, but... 
it's getting to be kind of a chore. <laughs> if the weather's right, it's not so bad. But the last few years, uh, you, you you can't put them up in October, and when it comes time on Thanksgiving, when you should be putting up in cold and snow, and it, it's kind of tough. But I think there's some pictures over on the table of when you hosted the Farm City Days. You want to tell us something about that? Well, that was in 18 or 19, 18, no, 1989. <laughs> We had, uh, as we say, we hosted the Farm City Day. I don't know, they said somewhere where it was around 3,000 people there. And we, this was the eighth one that they had in St. Croix County that we had, and it, it's still going on. It's, a, it's a quite a project. It's good for the, get the message out to the city people what the farming is like. But you know, people are so greedy, we had, served lunch that time. Some woman was stuffing buns in her purse. And oh. <laughs> it just, <laughs> it's unbelievable what uh, they do, you know. And uh, But I don't think we'll be doing it again because that was a that was a job, cleaning up and getting stuff going. I have to tell about hosting the school children. That was the most fun of all. <laughs> they get to the door of the barn <laughs> some of them, some of them would not go in. Some of them were all over everything, but they were mostly interested in the cats. <laughs> Chip would save some cows and milk them special so that when the kids came, they would be able to see how this all went. The milk was never touched by anyone. It goes right into the bulk tank. So they had some idea, but they still liked the cats. <laughs> and my daughter-in-law had displays out to show how much each cow ate, how much corn, how much silage, how much water each cow drank. And then at the end, it showed how many gallons of milk. These gallon jugs were, gallon, ju gallon jugs were all tied together as to depict how many gallons of milk a cow would give in a day. But they still like the cats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was when our Teresa's kids were in uh, in grade second grade and so on. It was in second grade. So. Then they that class had come up two years or three years in a row. We did that. Any other questions? Oh, I thought I had heard everything there was to be said about language until two years ago when we were putting up Christmas lights. There was a whole new language. <laughs> it wasn't German. <laughs> you want to make sure that gets on the tape? Chip, oh, Chip right. learned his, his father had more vocabulary when he was putting up the Christmas light. They'd go out to the barn and put them up and they'd plug them in and they wouldn't work. Take them back in the shop, plug them in and they'd work. Back in the barn. All of a sudden we heard this noise. We do have three grandchildren. Melissa is 24. She's graduated from River Falls. And Joel is a junior at Somerset and Carl's in the seventh grade, I believe. Yeah. And that's our family. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, let's thank the treasures, and I hope you'll come. Thank you. Lots of pictures. Yeah. 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 Yeah.